Good afternoon, dear colleagues. This is Donat Espan from the University Hospital in Zurich, Switzerland, speaking. The topic of my presentation is transfusion strategy, when red blood cells transfusions are needed and when not. First of all, I'd like to share with you my conflicts of interest or much better the spectrum of my activities. I do consult a few companies. I'm the co-chair of the European Trauma Treatment Initiative. I do consult universities, the US Department of Defense, and also professional societies. In addition, I have lots of interactions with companies and foundations. So a first take home message is that restrictive transfusion tr strategies are standard today. And here you find a short list of important references, papers, publications, guidelines that clearly state that restrictive transfusion triggers are standard. So these guidelines and recommendations, they can be summarized as stated in this short table. So you see the young and healthy, and this includes parturians following delivery. Here you have an RBC transfusion trigger in terms of hemoglobin of less than 60 grams per liter. The critically ill but clinically stable ICU patient, there you have a transfusion trigger below 70 grams per liter. Patients undergoing cardiac surgery, there you have a hemoglobin below 75 grams per liter as a transfusion trigger. And in elderly patients with hip fracture and cardiovascular diseases, there you have a hemoglobin below 80 grams per liter. There is no situation described where a hemoglobin above 80 grams per liter represents an RBC transfusion trigger. So then you find also the always those that say, but well, you know, there is this subgroup of the subgroup of the subgroup of patients that are so ill that we need to transfuse them more liberally. And usually a complex cardiac surgery is taken as an example. And it, it is exactly this group of patients that uh, David Mazur and his colleagues uh, in, investigated a few years ago in the prospective randomized trial, including more than 5,000 patients undergoing cardiac surgery on cardiopulmonary bypass. The, and they looked at patients with a euro score of more than six, so really sick patients. And the hemoglobin transfusion trigger was below 7.5 grams per deciliter versus less than 9.5 grams per deciliter in the OR and in the ICU. And the primary outcome was a composite outcome of death, myocardial infarction, stroke, new renal failure with dialysis. Secondary outcomes were RBC transfusion and clinical outcomes. And here you see the main result. The, the primary outcome, the composite outcome, uh, was you know 11% in the restrictive uh, group and 12.5% in the liberal uh, group. So the difference, the odds ratio for mortality and the combined outcome was 0 0.90. This was not statistically significant, but in a tendency in favor of the restrictive transfusion trigger. The restrictive transfusion trigger group anyway um, and, and, uh, needed fewer transfusions. So only in about 50% uh, the patients were transfused versus 72% in the liberal group. And this difference was highly statistically significant. So after this study became public, you know, those who still tried to justify a liberal transfusion trigger, then they said, well, but you know, there may be some patients with coronary artery disease, with unstable coronary artery situation, with acute myocardial infarction, they may benefit from a more liberal transfusion strategy. So this study was also just recently published, again, prospective randomized 700 patients with acute myocardial infarction, 
And they randomized these patients to a hemoglobin transfusion trigger below 80 versus below 100. They looked at death, stroke, recurrent myocardial infarctions, and emergency revascularization due to ischemia. And you see here that the primary outcome in the as treated uh, population or as randomized population, it's exactly the same, namely that these uh, major adverse uh, clinical outcomes occurred in the restrictive uh, hemoglobin transfusion group at, in 11% of patients versus 14 in the liberal. So this difference was not statistically significant. Um, but if you, you look simply at you know, in relation to time after randomization and the rate of these uh, adverse major cardiovascular events that in the liberal group, there was again a tendency that this adverse outcome occurred more frequently than in the restrictive transfusion group. So today, and this is really a very, very solid conclusion, it is clear that restrictive transfusion triggers are the standard and the scientific, scientific evidence for this is really very, very strong. So what is the experience uh, from our university hospital in Zurich um, when we introduced these restrictive transfusion triggers? Um, so the introduction of such restrictive transfusion triggers, that's not a super trivial thing. So we looked at a three-year period uh, where we included more than 100,000 patients. And in this three-year period, we had two interventions. The first was the mandatory transfusion guidelines by the medical director that was introduced in April 2012. And then in uh, um, January 2014, we introduced a patient blood management monitoring and feedback program. We will get back to that, what this really is. We looked at transfusion outcomes, transfusion costs, and clinical outcomes. So the patient blood management monitoring and feedback program, that is the following, namely that each transfusion was recorded electronically. I mean, this is uh, self-evident. Uh, but then in addition, this program added the following information, namely with, to which patient was the uh, transfusion given, where, in the OR, in the ICU, uh, on, on the ward, which physician actually is responsible for the transfusion. And then the system also recorded the last hemoglobin, the last PT, factor five levels and plate accounts prior to transfusion. And then uh, in the quarterly benchmark reports, uh, we send to the department heads on guideline conformity. So we tell them how many uh, uh, transfusions were off the guidelines, were too liberal, in terms of red blood cells, FFP and platelets. And if uh, the thresholds are transgressed more than 10%, there first is a meeting with the department head for a specific explanation and uh, the offer to do a uh, um, uh, postgraduate uh, educational event uh, for his team. And if again, in the next quarter, there is no significant improvement on the transfusion behavior, the department head gets a list of all two liberal transfusions and he, she needs to respond in writing why they gave the transfusion while this transfusion was not indicated according to our own transfusion guidelines. And you can see here uh, on the highest level here, this is all transfusions. Introduction of the transfusion guidelines by the medical director. You see the period afterwards, nothing happened, zero effect. Here, we started with the uh, patient blood management uh, monitoring and feedback uh, program. And all of a sudden, you know, all transfusions, RBCs, plates at the FFP decreased very, very significantly. A few years later, we asked the question of whether the success of this monitoring and feedback program would be maintained over the years. So we looked at the introduction period. We looked in the first year, 
uh, after the introduction and then the three years afterwards, uh, the sustainability period. Again, we looked at transfusion rates, numbers, uh, costs, etc. And we could show that, you know, uh, this is the pre-patient blood management monitoring feedback program. This was the first success, and this success was maintained over the years because we maintained the program. So RBCs in the end were minus 40%, uh, FFP minus 23, and platelets minus 27. So this is really a substantial finding, and it shows that if you prolong such a, such a system that you can maintain the great success that you have initially. And we also looked at the savings that we could achieve. And this is for the entire hospital. These savings were 3.7 million US dollars per year. So this is great savings for the hospital. And this is just the blood component acquisition costs. So in addition to uh, restrictive transfusion triggers, of course, the treatment of preoperative anemia is of key relevance. So therefore, the first question is, is preoperative anemia prior to major surgery, is that a frequent event? Think about it. The answer is yes. About 30 to 40 percent of patients scheduled for major surgery are anemic. And this is shown in many, many uh, studies and reports. This is from cardiac surgery. The incidence of anemia here was 31 percent. And you can see here that those with anemia had more transfusions, had a higher mortality, and a longer length of hospital stay. So major outcomes that we do not want to happen, therefore we need to treat preoperative anemia. This is another study in 33,000 patients from cardiac surgery. And they uh, asked the question, um, what is worse? Is it preoperative anemia or the higher rate of RBC transfusions that explains the adverse outcome of these patients. And it's, first of all, it's very interesting. This is the distribution of the preoperative hematocrit. And you can see here the median hematocrit is 39%, and this equals a hemoglobin of 130 grams per liter. This is just what we want to have prior to a major surgery. So this means that in this group of patients, 50% of patients started cardiac surgery with a too low hemoglobin. And the adverse outcome in terms of mortality, renal failure, and stroke was related to preoperative anemia. You see here the p-values and the area under the curve, and also was also related to the RBC transfusions for all different uh, outcomes. And in a relatively complex uh, statistical analysis, the authors came to the conclusion that the transfusion was more responsible than the preoperative anemia in explaining these adverse outcomes. I cannot follow this totally. There are other studies that come to different uh, conclusions, but anyway, whether it's the preoperative anemia or the need for transfusion that is responsible for the adverse clinical outcome, we need to treat preoperative anemia. That's the only way out of this uh, situation. And in preoperative anemia, the iron status, of course, is also important. And this landmark study by Manuel Munoz included more than 3,000 patients that were scheduled for orthopedic, cardiac, colon, prostatic, gynecological, and liver surgery, so major surgery. And they defined the focus group of operations as operations that are uh, as associated with a more than 10% transfusion rate or an expected blood loss of more than 500 mLs. 
and they defined anemia as an hemoglobin below 130 grams per liter in male and female. And this is very important. We do not want to distinguish between hemoglobin levels of males and females because the, during the operation, male and female patients bleed the same. Therefore, they need to start with the same adequate hemoglobin level. And they looked also at iron deficiency and they defined that absolute iron deficiency quite conservatively, namely with a ferritin below 30 nanograms per ml or below 100 nanograms and the TSAT below 20. And they found, uh, first of all, again, an overall anemia prevalence of 36% in cardiac surgery, for example, here about 40%. And then they found that in anemic patients, about half of the patients also had absolute iron deficiency. But they also found in non-anemic patients that in some, like in cardiac surgery, like 20% still had a absolute iron deficiency without concomitant anemia. And look at gynecological patients there, you have an incident of 60% of patients prior to major gynecological surgery that are not anemic, but still have serious absolute iron deficiency. So iron deficiency is very important and is not only a side effect of anemia. No, it's the other way around. Iron deficiency can result in anemia, but is not necessarily associated with anemia. And this is uh, a, a secondary analysis of uh, the paper that we published in The Lancet 2019. We come back to this paper. And we looked at the type of anemia that we found in this study. Uh, we had about 240 patients, and you can see uh, iron deficiency was present in about two thirds of the patients. Yes, iron deficiency is very important as one reason for preoperative anemia. But there are others, we come back to that. And this is also what we found if uh, we look at the WHO data on type of anemia. And you can see here the types of anemia are color-coded and green is iron deficiency anemia. So the most important reason for anemia worldwide is iron deficiency. This is clear. However, here at the right end uh, of the graph, you see the 70 to 80, 80 plus year old. And you see here renal forms of anemia and GI related forms of anemia become more and more important while iron deficiency remains important, but it's not so the overwhelming reason for anemia in the elderly. And it's really the elderly that we are operating with major operations most likely. So please remember iron deficiency is important in anemic patients and is important in non-anemic patients, but not all anemia you see preoperatively is iron deficiency anemia. And if we talk about iron, we should understand a little bit on iron uh, metabolism. Again, iron deficiency in most uh, consensus groups is defined as a ferritin below 100 or a TSAT below 20, particularly preoperatively, which means prior to a blood loss, prior to iron loss. So you see the iron in the food is easily uptaken by the enterocytes. And then this iron is actively exported through the ferroportin receptor into the plasma, gets bound on transferrin, and bound on transferrin, the iron is distributed to, the, to all organs in the body, to the muscles, the heart, and also uh, about two thirds of the iron is used for it to be built into the newly built heme uh, in the bone marrow and and uh, uh, becomes part of the hemoglobin in RBCs. Once these RBCs uh, are around 100 days old, they get, uh, ma uh, uh, re they get taken up by the macrophages and uh, taken apart. And the iron, again, is exported into the circulation via the same ferroportin receptor as we have seen on the other side in the enterocytes. Now, everything is, is well uh, regulated. And hepcidin is a very important uh, uh, peptide produced in the liver to um, 
to avoid iron overload in the body. Now, this is all well, but if there is some inflammation, and we are not talking about uh, an infection, we are talking about an inflammation, CRP more than five uh, milligrams per liter. So if there is an inflammation, the liver produces more hepcidin, and if the patient has a kidney or a heart problem, the clearance is reduced, resulting in elevated hepcidin levels, and this, this hepcidin blocks the ferroportin receptor here and also here. And this means if you see iron deficiency preoperatively, giving oral iron is useless because the oral iron gets also taken up into the enterocyte, but also you know, the, the export into the circulation is blocked if the hepcidin is elevated, and this is quite often the case. Um, therefore, you need to treat preoperative iron deficiency with IV iron. And here you can see that if you give IV iron, already after eight hours, you see the iron accumulating into the bone marrow, where we really want to have it for the uh, incorporation in the newly built heme of uh, reticulocytes. So IV iron is efficacious in treating iron deficiency anemia. But in many patients, we don't have pure iron deficiency anemia, but we have anemia of inflammation, again, characterized by a CRP of more than five milligrams per liter. And here you see a list of disease diseases where anemia of inflammation is typical. Cancer, infections, inflammatory diseases, chronic kidney disease, chronic heart failure, chronic pulmonary disease, obesity, anemia, and ICU patients. So these are really the high-risk patients that we are treating and anesthetizing every day. And these patients, they have typically anemia of inflammation. And the anemia of inflammation, yes, includes iron deficiency or at least a reduced iron availability for incorporation in the, in the heme, but also there is an EPO problem, namely that if the hemoglobin goes down, we expect the, hemo, the EPO to go up and this response is blunted in anemia of inflammation and the little extra EPO we have does not have its full efficacy uh, and therefore, you know, it's a dual problem that re requires a dual treatment, namely IV iron plus EPO. And coming back to the uh, cardiac study uh, patients that we already discussed before, where we have seen two thirds are having iron deficiency, you can see here that 25% also have a too low endogenous EPO. And again, 25% have a low vitamin B12. And very astonishingly for many, about 50% of the patients also have an increased C-reactive protein. So we all tend to think about cardiac surgery as a clean surgery. Uh, and I'm not saying that these patients have an infection, they have an inflammation and this is 50%. So in these 50%, you need also EPO. So um, iron deficiency in cardiac surgery is or may be a problem. We investigated 730 patients, iron deficiency defined as a ferritin below 100. Uh, anemia, according to WHO, and outcome, we looked at mortalities, SAEs, major adverse uh, cardiac uh, uh, circulatory, cardiac or cerebral events, transfusions, length of hospital stay. And you can see the results were staggering in that we found that the 90-day mortality was threefold increased in patients with preoperative iron deficiency prior to cardiac surgery versus those without iron deficiency. And this was true for patients that were anemic, and this was also true for patients that were not anemic. Also, serious adverse events were much more frequent in, in iron deficient patients, and also thromboembolic complications were more often found. Of course, iron deficient, iron deficient patients were more frequently uh, 
um, transfused, had a longer ICU stay, and were longer hospitalized in uh, the hospital. So preoperative iron deficiency per se, with or without concomitant anemia, is a condition that needs treatment. Now let's go to the success of preoperative anemia and deficiency management. So this is a study that we published in The Lancet 2019. It's a prospective randomized trial in 500 patients, half of which were anemic and half had isolated iron deficiency. Um, we stratified the patients according to type of surgery, primary versus redo, on versus off bypass and dual platelet inhibition, yes, no to make sure that the high bleeders are nicely distributed between the two groups. The two groups were, as I said, randomized into a treatment group, and the treatment was a treatment of sub-Q EPO, IV iron, sub-Q vitamin B12, and oral folic acid versus a combination treat, a fourfold placebo treatment the day prior to surgery. So these patients in the um, control group, they received a sub-Q injection to mimic EPO administration. They got an IV infusion of uh, uh, saline, a sub-Q injection to mimic vitamin 12 administration and a oral placebo. And the outcome was the RBC transfusions within the first seven days after surgery. And this is the primary outcome you see in the treatment group. You had a zero transfusion rate median versus one RBC given in the first week. And this was statistically significant and maintained statistical relevance over the first 90 days. And this graph here, uh, is very nice to explain how this might be explained because the hemoglobin level prior to surgery was of course the same in both groups uh, and this is the, the days post-operative day one, post-operative day three and post-operative day five in placebo treated patients in blue and actively treated patients with EPO and IV iron in red. And you see the hemoglobin up here is on the first post-operative day is already higher and remains higher over the entire first five post-operative days. But at, at, at the same time, these were the patients that had lower transfusion rate. So how comes? The explanation, I think, is the reticulocyte count down here, where you see that, you know, in the treated patients, the reticulocyte count increased tremendously. So this very short-term uh, treatment with EPOS and IV iron, vitamin B12 and folic acid boosted RBC production tremendously and explains why these patients had a higher hemoglobin but fewer transfusion than a controlled patients. Now, recently, this study, the PREVENT study, was also published in The Lancet. This was also a prospective randomized trial in uh, nearly 500 anemic patients. Now, the problem with this study is that iron parameters, they were rarely measured and not reported. So the authors treated anemia with IV iron, and this is simply wrong. I'm sorry to say so, and we published this also in a letter to The Lancet because the IV iron, and this is ir irrespective of which IV iron drug you use, they used uh, mainly uh, ferrocarboxymaltose in their study, uh, is, because this IV iron uh, uh, drug is only indicated for the treatment of iron deficiency based on laboratory tests, which they didn't report at least. And it's formally contraindicated in anemia, not attributed to iron deficiency. And if you're not measuring ferritin and TSAT, you have no clue of whether anemia is due to iron deficiency or whether you have another form of anemia and therefore the IV iron is contraindicated. So guess what? There was no difference, but this is only to, uh, to once again show that the indications and the contraindications of IV iron drugs are correctly defined. IV iron is only there to treat iron deficiency. 
And if iron deficiency is the most relevant cause of anemia, of course the hemoglobin goes up some time after the IV iron treatment. But if the iron deficiency is not the main cause of the anemia, hemoglobin won't change a lot after IV iron administration. Iron deficiency, however, is a disease, a disease in itself. And that's very important to realize. And this study, or respectively this review in The Lancet that, that just appeared a few weeks ago is so important to read. I can only recommend you to read this because it clearly states, and this is just from the abstract that I write here, that anemia is one of many consequences of iron deficiency. Clinical and functional impairments can occur in the absence of anemia. And iron deprivation from erythroblasts and other tissue occur when total body stores of iron are low. And this is indicated by low ferritin. Or inflammation, CRP is high, causes withholding of iron from the plasma, particularly through the action of hepcidin. And this is then the situation where Tsat is low. And you can see here the symptoms of iron deficiency. There is a long list, a very long list. And at the end, there is also anemia, but it's not the symptom number one of iron deficiency. So in this study, they looked at many patients and they finally treated 184 patients with iron deficiency anemia that was reasonably defined with a ferritin below 100 or a TSAP below 20. And then they looked at the response of the hemoglobin. And you can see here, if the IV iron treatment was given shorter than one week prior to surgery, the hemoglobin increase was zero, so inefficacious. If it was between one and two weeks prior to surgery, you see the hemoglobin goes up a tiny little bit. And it only if it's more than two weeks prior to surgery given the IV iron, then the hemoglobin goes up significantly, but oh, eight grams per liter is significant, but it's not the greatest either. So if you're treating iron deficiency anemia with IV iron, then start early, at least three weeks prior to surgery. Because this study or this finding that a short-term IV iron infusion is not very efficacious in terms of hemoglobin increase towards the day of surgery, that's not alone. In this study, they looked at 64 patients with iron deficiency anemia, and they treated them a median of 33 days prior to surgery, and the increase of the hemoglobin again was only eight grams per liter. And in this study just published, uh, um, Marco Ranucci did not, only look, uh, did not only treat anemia with or iron deficiency with IV iron, but they had a very smart algorithm where they decided, you know, yes, this is pure iron deficiency anemia, then we give IV iron, or they, this type of anemia has some other forms or some other causes that also require EPO. And then they finally treated 114 patients according to their algorithm 13 days prior to surgery. And what they found is that, you know, the hemoglobin increase was dependent on the type of treatment. The highest was IV iron plus EPO, but this is relatively short time, again, eight grams per liter, despite the transfusion uh, rate was, you know, decreased to 60% in the treatment group versus 76% in controlled patients. However, in addition to a higher hemoglobin prior to surgery, they found postoperatively less low cardiac output situations in those treated with, according to their algorithm. They found a shorter ICU length of stay and a short hospitalization uh, duration. So their algorithm-based treatment of anemia and iron deficiency with IV iron and EPO resulted in some real clinical benefits. Um, this is an interesting study from colorectal cancer surgery from Australia. They included 500 patients, three-year period, and they started a preoperative anemia and iron deficiency clinic uh, in the mid-2015. Um, uh, 
So anemia was defined according to WHO, ferrit uh, iron deficiency by a ferritin below 30 or ferritin below 100 nanograms per ml and a T-set below 20%. And this treatment was given 18 days prior to surgery. They looked at transfusion of RBCs, length of hospital stay and costs. And the results are interesting in that, uh, you know, um, this is the reference year, 2015-16. This is the first year after the implementation of uh, a uh, anemia and iron deficiency treatment, and this is the second year. And RBCs then were given fewer and fewer, and length of hospital stay decreased. And here you see the net cost analysis. And uh, a little bit difficult to understand is, you know, the columns to the upper part, they mean financial losses for colorectal and uh, uh, major small and large bowel disease. But anyway, you know, before they had the anemia and iron deficiency clinic, on average, in all their colorectal cancer surgery, the hospital lost money. After the introduction of this program, it was still a loss, but much less loss. And in the second year, they could benefit. So they gained money by operating the, these patients. So it's very important to, to convince also the board of directors for such a program because financially, this is very beneficial for the hospital. So this is the, the way we do it in Zurich. We first of all define the focus group where we want to be active. Focus group again is RBC transfusion rates more than 10% or surgery with an ex surgeries with an expected blood loss of more than 500 ml. We try to make the diagnosis early and treatment early. We have a patient blood manager. We have an IT program that uh, tells us which patients are scheduled by the surgeons ahead of time. Um, and uh, the mission statement of our hospital is that we want to operate on patients in the focus group only in the elective setting, of course, in the elective setting, of course, if they are having a hemoglobin of at least 130 grams per liter and no iron deficiency, that means a ferritin above 100 or and a T-set of more than 20%. And if they are below these thresholds, we treat them according to this scheme here. So we have iron deficiency anemia. This is a hemoglobin below 130 and an iron deficiency with maintained uh, renal function. So we give them IV iron plus vitamin B12 plus folic acid. If it's renal anemia, so we have a creatinine clearance below 50, ferritin in these patients is most always above 100, T-SAT is main, mostly also above 20%. So the, here we give EPO, IV iron, vitamin B12, and folic acid. If we have anemia of inflammation, so we have anemia, ferritin here is always above 100, and the T-SAT can be above, but mainly is below 20%. But the key issue here is CRP above five milligrams per liter. Here we treat with EPO, IV iron, vitamin B12 and folic acid. If we are having isolated iron deficiency, that means no anemia, but the ferritin below 100 or a T-SAT below 20, then we give IV iron. So the conclusions are that restrictive transfusion strategies are standard today. Adherence to a transfusion algorithm needs to be monitored. Preoperative iron deficiency and anemia needs to be treated early, at least three weeks prior to surgery. Please remember not all anemias are iron deficiency anemia. Many types of anemia are anemia of inflammation and they require the addition of EPO and nearly 50% of cardiac surgery patients do have a CRP above five milligrams per liter and thus fall into category of anemia of inflammation. And remember the hemoglobin increase you can expect after IV iron versus EPO plus IV iron is totally different. If you're giving only IV iron, you can expect a 10 gram per liter increase of hemoglobin over three to five weeks 
And the first increase is visible only after more than two weeks. In contrast, if you are giving EPO plus IV iron, you can expect a 10 gram per liter increase starting in the first week. And don't, uh, don't forget vitamin B12 deficiency is quite frequent in cardiac and in the elderly and needs to be treated concomitantly. Thank you so very much for your attention.